Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Banks on the Brink, Financial Crisis, State Bailouts, and the Global Slump. My name is Shireen, and I'll be moderating the event today. Today's discussion is organized by Spectre Journal and Haymarket Books. Spectre Journal is a new Marxist journal that aims to reinvigorate debate on the revolutionary left, recentering questions of oppression. Thank you to Haymarket Books uh, for co-sponsoring the event, and thank you also to Amanda Lundberg for live captioning. The event is free, but we ask that those who are able to uh, make a solidarity donation to our publishing and programming work and subscribe and donate to Spectre Journal to allow our radical journal to continue. All of us have likely been hit by infl inflation over the past year. We've seen the cost of eggs, in particular balloon, and, and now many of us are watching as Signature Bank and Silicon Valley Bank collapsed and, and wondering what's coming next. Today's event will aim to explain these circumstances from a left-wing, a, a Marxist perspective, and explain what this means about the economy and the, the, tra the future trajectory, the trajectory of capitalism, and so on. So our speakers are Michael Roberts and David McNally. Michael Roberts is the author of The Long Depression and Capitalism in the 21st Century. David McNally is the author of Global Slump and Blood and Money. Unfortunately, Hadass Thier uh, was not able to make it today, but hopefully this is the start of a longer conversation that she and others will be part of. So we're going to start off with uh, talks from each speaker for about 12 minutes and then open it up for, for conversation between the two speakers and then followed by audience questions. So feel free to take it away, uh, Michael. Thank you, Shireen, and uh, thank you, Spectre and uh, Haymarket, for inviting me to speak on this uh, issue, which has exploded in the last few weeks, starting in the US and spreading into Europe, namely yet another banking and financial crisis. We remember the global financial crash of 2008-9, and regularly there are problems with banks, but now we seem to have a major development that we haven't had since then, uh, exploding in the last uh, three weeks. What's the nature of this particular uh, bank and crash? Well, in a way, it's a classic run on the banks. The people who have deposited their monies in these banks, in particular three of them, uh, have rushed to remove their deposits and put them elsewhere because they fear that the bank will not be able to meet their cash demands when they need it. We started off with the Silicon Valley Bank, and that's significant because it was in California and concentrated uh, getting clients from uh, tech startups in particular and from venture capitalists in the tech and pharma industries based in California. Uh, companies and rich individuals would deposit their money at the Silicon Valley Bank. SVB, as a result of that, had a large number of deposits concentrated in this, in this, in this sector and at very high levels of deposit level, above uh, the official uh, threshold for getting your money back from the government as it were, or from the banks in general, of $250,000. Once you're over that, you're uninsured, as it were. And so that money is op open to be lost completely. And suddenly there appeared to be a run on the SVB, followed up by a run on another bank signature, which concentrated on cryptocurrency uh, clients. And then later on, uh, First Republic, a, a bank also that had large cash deposit uh, depositors in California, although it's in a way, New York based. These three banks suddenly came, had a real rush, in particular SVB, which uh, suddenly lost tens of billions of dollars within hours. Remember, now we're on the internet as we speak. Uh, we no longer have to go down to the road and bang on the door for our money. We can just pre a, press a button and it comes back uh, to another account that we have organized for. So that's what started to happen very quickly with SVB. Why? Well, it, it appears to be the case that SBB found that it could not meet uh, the level of cash uh, withdrawal demand. Why was that? Well, a lot of tech companies are finding it much more difficult uh, to make ends meet in the recent period, particularly startups. They found that the money they're getting from venture capitalists were being cash burned very quickly and they weren't getting any more. Why? Because venture capitalists were saying, well, we're not, the tech industry doesn't look so great. Profits aren't going up as much as they were before and people are not making money. So, uh, these tech firms 
were starting to burn their cash fast. And it became clear that uh, the board of SVB couldn't manage uh, to pay all those uh, withdrawals as they picked up, particularly when it became clear uh, that everybody else was with, with withdrawing. Why was that? Because what SBB had done, that they'd uh, invested the cash deposits that had been put into the bank into government bonds. Now, what could be safer than government bonds? What could be safer than Uncle Sam? It's not going to go default. But what they did was they invested in three five-year bonds, which meant that they couldn't get their money back unless they sold them on the secondary bond market. And because interest rates have been rising hugely since the Fed started hiking rates uh, just about a, a year ago uh, to heap much larger uh, have levels of interest rate that existed when SVB bought its bonds, the value of those bonds have dropped away in the secondary market. So it's like buying a second hand car. It gone down hill and the value of the car had deteriorated and yet they were forced to sell it. They couldn't wait until they got their money back in three or five years. So. When it became obvious to depositors that SVB was uh, unable to meet its cash demands, then there was a massive rush on getting their money out of it. And the bank very quickly not only found it doesn't have enough money, it was basically insolvent and it would had to be closed down within days. That situation uh, spread to, say, the other two banks and fear then raised that it was going to spread to a whole range of smaller regional banks in the US and it, it seems even in larger banks in Europe, uh, there was a beginning of fear and a run on the banks. It's now estimated that something like $600 billion worth of uh, bonds held by these banks are unrealized losses. In other words, if they had to sell them today, they would lose $600 billion. That's about 2% of US GDP. So that gives you an indication of the damage that could have been caused if these uh, banks fell apart and were forced to sell uh, their bonds. So naturally, what has happened is that the Federal Reserve and the monetary authorities have stepped in and they have offered huge amounts of liquidity, uh, borrowing facilities in order to enable not only SVB, who has gone to the wall, but other banks uh, to uh, keep going like First Republic. It's estimated in just three weeks, the Fed has lent out $600 billion through various uh, different facilities to mainly regional banks, mainly in California, but not just there. And on that basis, they've tried to prop up uh, uh, the banks and, com and convince people, uh, depositors and others, that there is not going to be a banking crash. And Jay Powell and the US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is telling us that the banking industry is resilient and there's no problem. We've got plenty of cash. We'll be able to handle this. Well, that may or may not be the case. All I would add in the time I've got available is that this crisis, in my opinion, is not over because these banks may have, been, have got a lot of government bonds which don't, aren't worth what they were before, but they've also lent huge amounts of money into the commercial and real estate uh, sector, commercial real estate, into offices, uh, malls, uh, other buildings and structures, not residential, but into these. this area has been a big uh, lending area particularly for small and regional banks in the US and also in Europe in the case of uh, Credit Suisse, which has just gone, been taken over, and also Deutsche. So there's huge liabilities or risks for these banks because the housing market is going down, the commercial real estate market is collapsing, uh, the rents, uh, people are defaulting on their, on their obligations for rents and for, for carrying through developments. Uh, so there's a real danger that there could be a further cash problems uh, for these uh, banks. So it's not over yet. And that if that spreads into the commercial real estate sector in a big way, then we could see the Fed is going to have to uh, plow in a lot more money. So I would add too at this point that this in some people will say, well, this is not a bailout. What's happening is the uh, Fed's providing liquidity. Uh, if a bank goes under, other banks are coming in either to buy it up or to offer it money. So it's not going to affect the ordinary person in the street or at home uh, in any way. Well, that's not really true because what this is doing is it is reducing the ability of the banks, uh, but they're losing a lot of capital in doing this, and it's reducing their ability to lend in order to uh, meet the big ticket items that we require as individuals, householders, but also in businesses and so on, they're gonna find it much tougher to get loans. The cost of interest rates for those loans have risen considerably. So it's going to squeeze the US economy and other economies 
as we move into. And that's the underlying problem here, that what we've seen after a bonanza of profit growth since the pandemic in 2020 through 2021 and into 2022 and a massive rise in inflation, we're now beginning to see a turnover of that. The profits that the big companies are making is being decline, and the small companies are going under. There's always been something like 25 percent of American companies that barely survive on the profits they make in order to pay the debts that service the debts they've got. We call those zombie companies and they've, they've been around for a long time. But now the situation is squeezing on many of these companies and it's going to make it very much more difficult as the lending conditions from banks rise and interest rates rise. So the policy of the Fed to fight inflation, as they call it, which is a nonsense, but that was their policy, is actually squeezing uh, uh, Main Street and the smaller sectors and regional areas around the country and leading inevitably to a situation where it will accelerate what I think was already developing, which is a, a move towards a slump and a recession. The slowdown in the US economy is visible, except in employment, but that's something we could perhaps discuss, but it is visible. Only last week, the Federal Reserve projected this year's growth rate for the US economy at 0.4%, only 0.4%. That's not a recession. Well, that's okay. I don't know if you'll notice the much of a difference between 0.4% and zero, but I would add that uh, the measurement of the credit uh, squeeze that is now being applied as a result of this banking crash means that that 0.4% is going to disappear. By, by the uh, middle of this summer, well, I expect to see figures which suggest that the US economy is in contraction. And already that applies uh, to Europe as well. So the tightening process is going on. We have the crisis is not over. The squeeze is on the credit sector. The economy is beginning to uh, buckle under this pressure. So inevitably, we're going to have a situation uh, where it will get worse uh, in terms mainly not in the banking sector, but into Main Street itself. And that's the, the real issue that faces uh, ordinary people, because it means then unemployment will start to rise. Then it won't be possible to compensate for the big price increases we've seen over the last 18 months. That's the situation that the banking crisis presents to us and exam uh, it shows us as an example. Finance is always unstable. It, it's it has an inherent instability. That's something we as Marxists and socialists have uh, understood and explained for some time. But now it's coupled with the inability of uh, the Main Street sector to grow uh, as a result of the squeeze and the crash that's taking place in banking. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, David, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, thanks Shireen, and thanks as always to Haymarket Books who are just amazing sponsors of events like this. Uh, to you, Shireen, and to Amanda, to Sean, and to Ashley, who are making all of this happen be behind the scenes. It's always much simplified following Michael because he has laid out with such clarity the overall perspective as to what's going on. And I will really just try to fill in a few areas around the margins and maybe come back in a little more depth to the question of why central banks in North America and Europe are so obsessed with ostensible inflation uh, at the moment and, and what is driving that. But I'll start really by saying that the safe prediction, as Michael has made clear to us, is that we will see more bank failures and that we will see a global recession. The precise timing, the, act, the precise dimensions of this are not predictable, but the basic dynamics and rhythms, I think, are. Even in the mainstream, we're starting to see some growing recognition that there are, shall we say, some problems out there. My two favorite descriptions of the past week or so uh, were one from an asset manager who referred to what we're confronting as, quote, a slow rolling crisis, uh, unquote. But my favorite is a New York University economist who said we're looking at, quote, a zombie horror flick. <laughs> 
uh, and friends at Haymarket will know my particular appreciation for uh, zombie and vampire metaphors. Now I'll come back to to zombies that which Michael already touched on shortly, but let's put this in a bit of a context initially. We are still looking at the legacies of the economic crash of 2008-9 and the way in which central banks around the world intervened to prevent what they perceived as the beginnings of a catastrophic meltdown of the global financial system. And so they intervened with a speed and a depth which they'd never used before. It really didn't matter how large the bailouts had to be. It didn't matter how massive so-called quantitative easing had to be. And it didn't matter if they effectively drove interest rates down to zero so that anyone with some kind of incorporated business could borrow and borrow virtually for free. And the result was that they did prevent a complete meltdown of the global financial system. But it also meant that we did not get the kind of restructuring that a deep slump causes. Because as Michael has written about many times, 2008-9 was driven by a global crisis of overaccumulation and declining profitability. And in that situation, the inherent mechanism of capitalism is that the least efficient units of capital get driven out by a slump so that the most efficient can restructure, grab greater market share, reorganize production and reestablish profitability. But if you flood the system with liquidity, the way the Fed and other central banks did, you allow so-called zombie companies to stay alive. And as Michael and others have written about, something like 15 to 20% of the companies out there in Europe and the United States today were so-called zombies before the Fed and other central banks started raising interest rates. To be a zombie means that there is no inherent profitability. They're on life support and they can stay on life support so long as money from the banking system is effectively free. But once the Fed decided that its inflation fighting, to which I'll return, was necessary, and therefore they started jacking up interest rates, those zombies now have a problem. If they are going to roll over their debts, for instance, debts that were at 0.75%, now have to be renewed at three and three and a half and four percent and they're not generating the profits to sustain that as a result we began to see loans in these sectors really drying up in commercial real estate so far this year loans are down by 50 percent in the united states in other words Companies that are sitting there with half-developed shopping malls, with office towers that have only 40% capacity, 60% of the office space is sitting empty, they're not making money, now they're coming under a credit crunch. And so this is going to be exacerbated. They started, therefore, to pull cash to meet operating expenses. And so a bank like Silicon Valley or a bank like Signature with loads of loans out to companies in this sector that were now scrambling, these sectors, they began to watch deposits flee. Silicon Valley firms, commercial real estate firms started to draw down their deposits. So they were cash short. And as Michael said, they then had to cash in depreciated assets. And that means booking losses which is disastrous for the viability of banking. About 70% of the nearly $6 trillion in commercial real estate loans in the U.S. are in the hands of small to medium-sized regional banks. These banks are incredibly vulnerable going forward. 
And as a result, more and more depositors are going to lose faith. They are going to keep shifting funds out of this sector. So when interest rates started to go up, what we really had was a transformative moment in which zombie companies were now producing zombie banks. I really want to emphasize this point. The zombie companies that have survived since the crisis of 2008-9, that crisis of overaccumulation and declining profitability, those companies represent the fault line of the system that is now being manifest in the very banks that have been servicing them. So that's why I, 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 I like this metaphor of zombie companies now producing a set of zombie banks that are in, in deep trouble. Okay, given this scenario, why is the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States, the European Central Bank and others, why are they pursuing a so-called war on inflation? And here I want to suggest that the primary reason is to wage class war from above. That while it is absolutely true, as Michael and others have pointed out, that the wave of inflation was not driven by a wage explosion. It is not true that wages have driven this inflationary cycle. The central bank in the United States in particular has been expressing deep concern for over a year about an impending wage explosion. In other words, the danger that workers begin to play catch up with, wide, with rising prices. When I first came into the left as a teenager in the 1960s, it was very common for unions in Canada at the time to be winning double digit wage increases in a single year in contracts because they were dealing with 10 and 12 percent inflation in the consumer price index. And the Fed as a central bank has been very focused on two key things, the so-called quit rate in the United States, what some people have called the great resignation, the greater willingness of workers to leave behind low paying jobs because they know there's another employer out there. And so-called tight labor markets have made this possible. So that last year, for instance, 4 million US workers just quit a job and moved on somewhere else. And they were in search of better wages and working conditions, of course. At the same time, in the 12 months that ended last September, there were 2,500 union petitions by groups of workers in the US before the National Labor Relations Board. And this was more than a 50% increase from the year before. Workers at Starbucks, Trader Joe's, Amazon, Apple, and so on, have all been organizing on the job. The Fed's worry is that an inflationary environment will ultimately provoke more unionization and a, wa and a wave of wage strikes. And I'd love, Michael, in our conversation afterwards to hear your thoughts in the British and European cases in, in this regard. I want to give you a, a quote from Jerome Powell, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States last June at a press conference, when asked if wages were really the target of what he was doing. And Powell, in a certain kind of central banker doublespeak, said the following, quote, there is a very, very tight labor market, tight to an unhealthy level. If you were moving down the number of job openings, you would have less upward pressure on wages. If you were moving down the number of job openings means if you were inducing a recession that was creating less demand for workers, this would have a dampening effect on wages. Now, Paul Volcker, who led the big shockwave against inflation in the 1970s and 80s, said famously in 1979, quote, the American standard of living must decline, unquote. Really, that's what Jerome Powell is saying in his own way. We're going to make sure that there is no rising wave of labor insurgency in the United States, which drives up wage levels and imperils the profitability recovery. 
that they so desperately need. So let's be clear that this is not about economic well-being. It is about inflicting pain on the working class by, quote, moving down the number of job openings, unquote, in order to suppress income growth, depress labor organizing, and protect profitability. Uh, which is all another way of saying, and I know I 100% have Michael's assent on this, that it's a reminder that we ought to be done with capitalism. Great, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I, Michael, I, I want to invite you to respond to David, but also um, for those watching, uh, remember to enter your questions in the comments section and, and we'll take them up. Um, and, and thanks to both of you for making this topic uh, accessible for us. Go ahead, Michael. Well, David's raised a uh, question, what's happening in, in the UK in the same way as the Fed is operating and Powell's position in the US. We have it possibly even more stupidly uh, in, in the UK with the Bank of England Governor Bailey, who um, this is even the uh, financial analysts reckon he's the most stupid uh, Bank of England governor we've ever had because he blurts it out all the wrong way. And he only said at the beginning of the inflationary spiral we took uh, uh, about six months ago when the inflation picked up. By the way, UK inflation is not f even slowing down at the moment. The last figure for the UK was 10.4 percent. We're still in double digits. Uh, you Americans are having it easy. Um, uh, and in that situation, when the acceleration of inflation took place, Bailey said, uh, look, I'm not saying people shouldn't get uh, increased wages, but if they ask for more money, all they're going to do is drive prices up more. And so it's self-defeating. So what we want is wage restraint uh, and that will bring down inflation. So it, it appears that the position of the Bank of England governor is the solution to inflation is to hike up interest rates as high as possible and to hold down wages as low as possible, even if that means uh, people leaving huge amounts of money each year. We estimate in the in the UK, we can have a 6% fall in living standards uh, during the last year. And this is the, uh, just to tell you guys over there, that the restraint on real wages in the UK has lasted the longest and as heaviest for 200 years. That's how damaging the inflation rate is at the moment. And yet our uh, central bank governor says that we need higher interest rates and we need to hold down wages, just as uh, Paula said something similar. And over in uh, fr in uh, Frankfurt, we have the European Central Bank with Christine Lagarde telling everybody last week that there is no trade-off between hiking interest rates to control inflation and financial instability. In other words, uh, we keep on hiking interest rates to, to get inflation down. It won't have any effect, effect on financial markets and on the, the state of the banks. Well, uh, I don't know how demonstrably that true that is now after the last three weeks, because clearly it is uh, a trade off. And the evidence is clear that that's the direction. If they continue to hike interest rates, they will squeeze the bank's credit. The zombie companies will get in the worst position and we're heading not only for a slump, but probably uh, a rolling series of uh, bank defaults over the next. Now, maybe they'll reverse that policy because it will frighten them so much. But that's uh, they're putting a brave face on it and going for it. I'll just finish on another point. Hiking interest rates to control inflation is ridiculous. It's not working. It's never worked. The reason for the inflationary spiral we have at the moment is clearly to do with the massive increase in energy and food prices in particular. And also the fact that it's had a hit through supply chain blockages since the pandemic. It's nothing to do with excessive demand or too much uh, wages. We need to cut uh, uh, cut interest rates, actually, to keep the economy going rather than raise them. Yeah, I'd love to come back on, on Michael's point there because there's a fascinating study Anybody who wants to find it can just go to a site called Real Economy, where two economists and, you know, they're, I might quibble with elements of their model, but I think they're broadly right. They argue that for the U.S. economy to get to 2% inflation, 
will require a recession with job losses of 6 million. It will require a more than doubling of the current unemployment rate, the official rate. Uh, will have to go up to about 7.3%. Uh, we know the reality is higher. But the point is, really what they have to do if they want to wring inflation out is to induce that kind of recession. And there is absolutely no doubt, going back to the points that Michael and I have been making about startups in Silicon Valley, commercial real estate, and so on, that you are going to see a whole lot of firms bankrupted. And it's going to mean that a lot of banks in these sectors have bad loans out there. You know, one of the things that's really interesting about the so-called bailout of First Republic Bank, always read between the lines because they say, oh, no, no, we're not bailing it out. Another bank is buying up its assets. Well, no. What banks are doing is they're coming along and picking and choosing like vultures. So the commercial real estate portfolio of First Republic Bank is not selling. No banks out there want those assets. And that's telling us right now that if the central banks keep pushing in this direction, those 6 million job losses in the United States, the doubling or more of the rate of unemployment will have recessionary impacts. Uh, but that's why I think we're both insistent that this is a form of class war that's being waged through central banking and it's got nothing to do with somehow, quote, stabilizing the economy. Um, we do have some questions uh, coming in if, if we'd like to pivot to those. Um, Let's see. Uh, what, if anything, can the U.S. or other states do about bank failures? Will the bailouts work? What about regulation and how will this impact inflation? Um, and what can the central bank do but raise interest rates if import prices, energy interrupted supply lanes, lines rise? If you want to take those uh, first. Well, let me say about regulation. I mean. Regulation is usually the answer provided by all the economists and the officials. Uh, only this week, the head, international head of uh, regulation, the Basel III head, which the Basel III is the way in which banks are supposed to be regulated, how much capital they've got, what uh, risky loans they're making, and so on. They're supposed to keep to certain rules. Internationally, everybody's supposed to follow this. He said, uh, the trouble with uh, regulation is that nobody keeps to it. Uh, they keep not keeping to the regulation, they break the rules, and then we have to clear the mess up afterwards. And um, that's the situation. Regulation, trying to regulate big banks and companies everywhere, regulation is supposedly the solution to keep uh, capitalist operations uh, keeping to the rules of the game. It's just a nonsense. It doesn't work. Capitalism is more interested in making profits. Uh, the banks will break the rules. Take, for example, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, it was quite clearly go going into a serious risky area by putting all its uh, available cash into long term bonds uh, in order to make a higher rate of interest than it was getting uh, in terms of uh, where else it could have put the money or kept it just in, in deposits. And as a result of that, it got itself into a mess. Now, strictly speaking, it wasn't quite against the rules, apparently, but why not? A regulation was obviously insufficient that banks are allowed to expand in this way their uh, risky assets without any regulation. And after the event, of course, everybody says, well, that should never have happened, although there were always warnings that it was. So regulation is a complete useless weapon uh, in order to bring about stability for uh, uh, working people and be sure that their banks are safe. What we need are banks that are a public service. We don't need banks that speculate in investments, that can engage in all kinds of exotic uh, ways of trying to make huge amounts of money internationally and nationally. What banks should be for is to look after our money, pay us uh, our money out when we have to make transactions, and provide uh, loans at reasonable rates uh, so that we can buy our big ticket items or small companies can get the, the money they need not to be zombies, but to expand their economy. But we don't have banks like that. Uh, and if we do, 
they're so weak that they're the first ones to go. And as uh, David was saying, the big banks are now picking up and the bits and pieces of the, the assets of these small banks that are going to war. That's a solution. It's not a solution to me. Take SBB. It's now just been taken over by First Citizen Bank, um, which is another bank in California. They bought bought it at a 25 percent discount on the available deposits and assets that the SVB has before. And the Federal Deposit Insurance Company is giving it a 35 billion a dollar loan to get on with and a $70 billion credit line. And overall, the cost to the taxpayer, or at least the official government uh, source, the FDIC, is going to be $20 billion in order to hand over basically uh, SVB's assets to First Citizen Bank for, for peanuts. That's the sort of way in which we, we have a solution provided by the government. In, in, I'll finish on this point. So we don't need privately owned banks operating in speculative ventures like hedge funds. What we want are publicly owned banks, democratically run and providing a service to the public. That should be the way forward. Let's end the control of the big multinational banks. And for that matter, the big control of the big multinational energy and uh, other corporates. Just picking up on Michael's points here. One way of thinking about this is that virtually every proposal to regulate that's coming from anyone within the political mainstream operates on the principle that where banks are concerned, profit should be private and losses should be public. I'll repeat that. The profit should be private and losses should be public. In other words, when they are losing money, the public through public institutions like at the central bank that is not meant to be anything other than a custodian of the public interest in the financial sphere uh, comes in and bails them out. We're going to have to ask ourselves with this cycle of repeating financial crises that we're dealing with in this period, how many times should the public buy up the banks before you say, as Michael did, these should be publicly owned. You know, we're, we can go through another wave of bank failures where trillions of dollars in public funds are pumped into the banking system. But at some point, you have to pose the question of if the public is paying for them, why are not they public institutions? And that, of course, means to raise all of those questions that Michael was about the fundamental purpose of banks and the fact that we are talking about raising the issue of public ownership of banks by way of saying that the dominant assets of the modern economy should be in public hands serving public purposes, not private ones. So, you know, the wonderful thing about the regulation debate is that it allows you to open up all of these questions about the very structure of the modern capitalist economy. The, the other point I'll make about regulation is that regulators, even when they operate with conviction, and let's be clear, they often don't, but even when they do operate with conviction, are up against bankers who are constantly inventing new financial instruments that are not captured in an existing body of legislation or rules uh, and new kinds of financial vehicles. During the great run up to the mortgage asset driven crisis, these banks and, and, and other financial institutions were spinning off so-called special purpose vehicles, which allowed them to do inside their, quote, special purpose vehicles, things they weren't allowed to do within their holding company, the bank. And bankers will keep doing this. New exotic financial instruments, new ownership structures that allow them to elude regulation. So at a certain point, we simply have to say, why continue with this game when, in fact, public ownership begins to fundamentally address the issue, but, of course, in a radical way that the mainstream doesn't even want to entertain? So both of you talked about um, the issue of uh, demanding public ownership of banks. Um, 
uh, one question I got is, uh, what are some immediate demands that the left should raise about the financial sector? Is that one of them? Is that not an immediate demand? Or what are some of the other ones? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think it is one of the immediate demands. You could say that, uh, oh, that's a bit far away. Nobody's going to support that position uh, uh, in the States or in the UK. It's interesting to note um, that uh, in the UK, we had a left uh, Labour Party for a while under Jeremy Corbyn, a kind of reasonably radical programme. It was demanding the renationalisation of the energy industries, uh, bringing about some of the key sectors of the big um, utility monopolies under public ownership. It was calling for government and public investment uh, to take the economy forward. But one thing it did not have in its programme which was to bring the banks into public ownership. It again had the policy basically of regulation or of uh, setting up one publicly owned bank to compete with all the other big uh, multinational banks. So there is a certain taboo, it seems, against the idea of taking on the finance sector and bringing it under public ownership. But it, it seems to me that it's the fundamental kernel of how we can begin to change our economy for the interests of working people rather than for those that uh, the one percent that control everything in our society both in in the states and in europe if we don't have control of credit if we don't have control of the financial sector so that we can direct money not into exotic instruments for banks to make uh, profits on and then go bust but into productive investment where companies dis need that money where we can expand the economy and provide support also for government plan. And until we have control of credit and finance, we can't really begin to transform an economy in the interests of working people. So it seems to me an immediate demand. And it, I don't think it sounds so terribly out of trim, given the environment we're in, the, even in the last three weeks, people can recognise that how, as David put it very well, how much longer are we going to go on with this game? of uh, saying to the banks, oh, you've done something wrong, so we've got to change the rules a bit more this time. And uh, sorry about that, but here's some money to keep you going. And let's wait for the next 10 years before you go crashing down again. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. And I think looking at it in the US context, what's clear is that the bank bailouts from 2008 nine were hugely unpopular enormously so now there was a right wing move to capitalize on that which was the tea party movement on the fringes and then increasingly in the mainstream of the republican party but one should never underestimate the degree to which the bernie sanders presidential campaign was really driven by hostility to the idea that Washington is simply a handmaiden of the banks. And it allowed a discourse of socialism to reemerge on a much larger scale. Please, no one understand me. I think ultimately Bernie Sanders is a New Deal liberal. But the idea that the term socialism was in the air as a response to that crisis of 2008-9 was hugely important. Millions of young people were electrified and inspired by the idea, and we still see it with uh, one public opinion poll after another. Socialism in both the United States and Canada remains enormously popular among young people 35 years and under. So to talk as Michael is about public ownership of the banks, may sound like it's completely outside the political orbit in some sectors. But if you're thinking about building a socialist movement for the future, this resonating with young people. It resonates with the young multiracial working class that's organizing at Starbucks and Amazon and Apple and so on in the United States today. The other point I'd make about this, and Michael and I would need another session to do any justice to this, is that in particular, if you're going to talk about a serious transition away from carbon capitalism, then the idea of a publicly owned banking system 
that would massively invest in public projects in solar and wind power, for instance, to accelerate decarbonization makes a huge amount of sense because you've now got the assets of a public banking system at your control to carry out public investment toward, to transition towards a post-carbon economy. So all of these key political and ecological questions converge around this issue of whether we're happy to let the flows of money and finance be for purposes of private profit, and they can be fantastically profitable if you're Citibank or Goldman Sachs, uh, or whether in fact, we think they ought to be in public hands because the public keeps bailing them out. Uh, and therefore, if you will, retrofitted for public purposes. Yeah, I'd ask the uh, viewers, do we think we really want to carry on with uh, Citibank, Bank America, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley to go on forever? We're not going to take control of these these gangs of financial institutions so that we can use them in a more effective way and productively? Are they to go on doing this forever and ever? Okay, there's several more questions along these lines. Um, one question is, for how long do you think the state can put off a deeper and more prolonged recession or depression? They've been kicking the crisis down the road for a while, uh, or do you see another outcome? I'll, I'll add a couple more questions to it at the same time, if that's okay. Um, one is, what is the role of cryptocurrencies in this crisis? And another is, what impact will all this have on the tech sector? Feel free to take a combination or... Yeah. Do you wanna go first, uh, Michael? Okay, well, re recessions. Well, re remind everybody that we've had actually, in the 21st century, we've had already, we've had uh, three recessions. There was a very mild one in 2001, but it was it was severe for sectors of the economy. People forget about that one uh, very much. Then we had what is called the Great Recession of 2008-9, and it was the biggest uh, slump in production and investment and employment worldwide, the most extensive, much more extensive than the Great Recession, which is concentrated mostly in the north of the hemisphere, but across the, the globe, the Great Recession of 2008-9, which we've been discussing, triggered by the global financial crash. Then we've had the pandemic slump of 2020, which was even deeper, if, if shorter, but deeper than the Great Recession of 2008-9. So we've already, as we go into the uh, third decade of this uh, century, we've had uh, three slumps in most of the economies of the world. And now, as far as we can see, we're heading into another one in 2023 onwards. How deep it will be and how widespread it will be remains to be seen, but it, it's, it's, it's there. I, I, ref, people haven't probably had the opportunity yet to read yesterday, the World Bank published a report in which they took the prospects for the rest of this decade. And it is the most grim reading I've seen in any international economic report. There is no prospect of any decent growth uh, in the in the rest of this decade, in all the major economies, including the US, we're talking about a further slowdown from the growth rate that we had from 2010 to the end of the that decade, which was even slower than the previous decade. So the third decade of the 21st century is going to be the slowest, even slower. And then the World Bank says, and it could be slower if we have more recessions. Well, uh, you know, we've had three already. The chances of avoiding one in the, by the end of this uh, particular decade seems pretty slim to me. So the situation is really awful. Capitalism is past its used by date. How do we get out of that? Well, um, capitalism gets out of that by actually liquidating all the bit, bad bits, the, the failing bits of its uh, system, uh, the weak, uh, the sick. The, it wants to clear the wood away so that uh, the forest has had its fire and now the new uh, plants can shoot up. The idea now is it all shoot up using AI and robots and everything will uh, boom forward in a roaring uh, 2020s like it was after the uh, roaring 20s, like in 1920s after the after the First World War. Now they're hoping for a roaring 20s as we come out 
of this next one. Uh, the deeper the slump is, the better chance they've got of getting out of it. But it will be a, a painful experience uh, for the rest of us. But I tell you, the World Bank report says forget about the roaring 2020s. It's not going to happen. Uh, that's that's the situation which uh, capitalism faces over the rest of, of this decade. So can capitalism get out of recessions and move on? Yes, it can if it hits us hard enough and enough people get injured and, and the weakest get removed. But if it doesn't do that, which has been trying to avoid on the whole for the last uh, period, as David said, then we'll just crawl along in this very low level of growth where uh, unemployment will remain high across the world, where wages will remain low, investment will be insignificant, the climate change emergency will hit us right in the face, nothing will uh, be, avoid it. All the latest reports say from the UN that we're not going to meet the Paris target of just having 1.5% centigrade increase in global temperatures. It's going to go higher than that, maybe even two and a half. Uh, there's no prospect of solving these major problems. Uh, and capitalism is failing. It's failing really badly. I haven't dealt with the other things. I'll leave that to David. <laughs> well, let me start with, with cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's There continues to be an enormous amount of confusion about these things. First off, let's be clear, in any meaningful sense of the term, these are speculative commodities, not money. Okay, I want to emphasize that. As a result, there can be speculative bubbles that will drive up the prices in a given cryptocurrency for a period of time, just like Dutch tulips could go through an extended speculative bubble. But if you're asking the question, can the financial system significantly shift in the direction of cryptocurrencies, the answer is no. And I'll give you just one little example to illustrate the point. Most Many people know that I'm living and working in Houston, Texas these days. In a relatively smaller town in Texas last year, there was a music festival sponsored by a cryptocurrency. Now, trust me, if you are money, the general equivalent that drives the economy, you don't have to go around sponsoring anything. When was the last time you saw a sports event or a music festival sponsored by the dollar? <laughs> well, of course you don't, because it's ubiquitous, because it is the general equivalent, the means of payment in all transactions. That doesn't mean that at the margins, other partial goods can play a very limited role. It is still the case if you go into prisons that cigarettes are often a currency, for instance. But if you tried to use cigarettes as a general equivalent, when you did your grocery shopping or put gas in your car or whatever, you'd have some troubles. And so crypto will continue to be out there enticing people who in the kind of economic low growth environment that Michael was describing are hoping to get rich quick. But it will be constantly prone to great inflationary bubbles, asset bubbles that then burst. And the other thing which I think more and more people are finally try, starting to get is that there are some big players in this game and that the average small fry who enters the crypto game tends to get massacred. It's the same as in any major speculative investment sector. The big guys tend to be able to rig markets in their direction for a period of time and then get out. And then the crash hits the small guys. That's tended to be the pattern. So crypto is going to continue to be out there uh, enticing people looking for get rich quick schemes, fast bucks and so on. Uh, it's also going to be prone to the kind of volatility and I mean extreme volatility of the sort of crashes that we've seen. Um, David, and can I ask you, did they pay in dollars for the festival? Or exactly, Michael, <laughs> precisely. Uh, they, you know, e even if 
there was, you know, transaction to buy a hot dog or a beer in crypto <laughs> somewhere. We all know that ultimately every one of these cryptocurrencies is measured in dollars. That's what it's valued in. And that tells us everything we really uh, do need to know about them. So watch crypto as a sector that could have great asset inflation and then enormous bursts and bubbles of the sort that we've already been seeing. And, and, and I don't see that probably disappearing anytime soon in this volatile environment, but also don't have any expectation that there will be any major move in that direction. Final point, crypto is not the same thing as a government central bank creating a digital currency. That's very different. The Chinese central bank is moving in this direction right now. But these are state central banks that start to digitize some of their currency operation. And that's not cryptocurrency. I was okay. going to say, Sharon, what do we think about the tech sector? I, I, I'm not an expert on this area, but it's the key area. It's a key area for not only the U.S. economy, but everywhere. And at the moment, we're all going mad over chat GBT and all the all the other machine learning devices, uh, AI that are hitting the uh, the media now and being used by people. There's a lot of talk about this is going to create the conditions for a huge uh, takeoff for the for the tech sector and therefore maybe a new area for capitalism to accumulate profits and growth. Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't know what other people think or Dave thinks. And, you know, Michael, I often use a lot of your writings to guide me here. And, and by that, what, what I mean is, look, robotics, for instance, are real in modern manufacturing and assembly line production. Robotics are there. But this has not resolved the productivity crisis. No. I mean, the you know, productivity growth in this century so far in the United States has been about half a percent a year. And half a percent a year compared with a kind of, you know, overall historic level of 3% a year speaks to all of those issues that the World Bank report that Michael was describing is talking about. A low growth capitalism that really is literally staggering to stay afoot. Uh, and, you know, not to simply lose its balance and topple over. And so there's no doubt that a given company in robotics may do very well. A given firm in AI may do quite well. The same is true in biotechnologies in the medical field, for instance. But that's very different than turning around the whole environment of profitability and investment. And Michael has shown in a series of writings that there is a long-term depression of profitability. And until it's resolved, the system cannot attain dynamism. But the problem, as we've been talking about, is that the sort of bloodletting that would be required, the deep, deep recession slash depression that would be required to radically reconfigure the global economy is immensely destabilizing. Uh, and frankly, just like they they really believe that the global financial system might come down in 2008-9, they, they know that too. And so for all the bluster right now about controlling inflation, I don't believe that there is any stomach within the global ruling class today to stand back and say, let a global depression rip and we'll see who's standing at the end. Yeah. The costs of that are incredibly high. Uh, and I don't just mean economically to no. enormous sections of capital, but also politically in terms of the oppositional forces and the insurgencies that it might generate. Um, well, I that relates to a question I was going to uh, just going to ask, um, how will all of this impact class struggle in politics? Um, you talked to you, you both talked about 2008 and and we know it triggered um, a massive wave of uh, protests and uprisings uh, globally. 
Um, is there the potential for a fight back in the current moment? Um, we're seeing a little bit in, in France, but uh, what chances are, are there of this spreading or, or, or what, what effects does, does this have on uh, the political economy, basically, and, and class struggle? Well, it's, we've, we have seen uh, uh, an intensification of the class struggle on the level of um, strikes and industrial disputes. I was looking at the UK figures. We've had a huge jump this year for the first time since uh, really uh, the 1980s, which shows you uh, perhaps the changes taking place. It's been decades. I was looking at the UK industrial disputes figures. For decades, they've been virtually down the bottom, near the zero line. Uh, nothing much happening. What's hap either has either been made settlements without industrial disputes or they've accepted uh, the situation that they've got. And we've had uh, real wages are stagnant now in the U UK for 20 years. Real wages, that's after inflation. Uh, yet in the last year or so, because of the impact of the pandemic and because of the uh, energy and food price multinationals massacring the uh, price, pricing market, 15% increase in inflation over the last two years on average in the major e economies. Uh, I'll put it this way, when the, when the, the central bankers tell us that um, inflation is slowing down thanks to our efforts, it's fallen from eight to six, what they forget or they will, don't want to mention is, yeah, okay, so now it's at 6% and not 10%, but over two or three years, that's 15% increase in prices. They're not going back to where they were two years ago, they're up high again and the wages are not matching it. And I think that's produced a response from uh, certainly the best, uh, better organized sections of, of the class, uh, both in Europe uh, and, uh, and in the US. But also the other fact, and you probably know better, is the um, development of new unions or new areas of workplaces that have been totally unorganized for the first time in key sectors of the economy, like the tech sector, like the, the social media sector and so on, for, for, for the first time with just the first signs that these people can organise. I've always thought the, the way forward for a, a intensification of the class struggle would not be to expect the public sector or the older traditional unions to be the forefront. We have to look for the new sectors that have grown over the last generation. And those sectors are just beginning to start that organization. Reminds me historically of the period after the great recession of the 19th century, at the end of the 1880s, early 1990s, is when mass unions exploded again uh, in areas that hadn't been ex had existed before. I think there are inklings of that's the direction that we're going to go in, in terms of working class struggle. Just to put it on the, on the other side though, the increasing forces of extremism on the right that are looking, uh, maybe the ruling groups, the mainstream groups of the ruling groups don't want an intense class struggle. They're prepared to just trundle along, but their extremist forces are in increasing in their intensity to take it on uh, with the class. And that's the danger that we'd, we, we could see in the future. Yeah, I'll, I'll start really where Michael was, was just concluding, and then I want to, shift to a different region. But I think that's absolutely right, that when you look at the what were the high growth sectors within U.S. capitalism in this century, for instance, that's where the unionizing is happening right now. This is where young people are starting to organize. You know, about 15 or 20 years ago, Robin Kelly essentially said in a really interesting essay that the left had to pay greater attention to the new multiracial urban working class in the United States. And he was really trying to say to people, don't imagine that the next wave of radical labor and working class action and organizing is going to look just like the last one of the 1930s and 40s. And what we're now seeing is that young, urban, multiracial working class in the United States beginning to move towards a greater sense both of the significance of union organizing and workplace action. Uh, and that's why I mentioned, for example, the petitions to the National Labor Relations Board that had doubled 
last year, 2,500 of them. The, and we need to emphasize these are the same young people who have been radicalized around Me Too and the Black Lives Matter mobilizations. For them, gender equality and racial justice are intrinsic to organizing in the workplace. And so they're not stuck in the first instance in a narrow business unionist model. They're expecting workplace organizing to address gender and racial justice issues as well as wages at work, working conditions, and so on, job security. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, when the first wave of the Black Lives Matter movement happened in the US, she said about the uprising in Ferguson, this was an uprising against austerity. And all kinds of people went, what? What's she talking about? This was against police violence. But what she was saying to us is, look, these are young working class people who are in furious with the police, but this is not new what the police are doing in Baltimore or Ferguson or later in Minneapolis or Atlanta or Memphis. This is not new, but somehow it's producing an uprising today in 2013, 14, 15, and so on, as it did again with the George Floyd uprising in 2020. She was drawing attention to the fact that this is a new layer, a new generation of young working class people coming into social struggle. And I think, and this is the point I'll, I'll conclude the, the, these ideas with, I think we have to pay great attention to Latin America right now. Because the crisis that we've been describing of rising interest rates is also translating into the beginnings of an, another global debt crisis. And it's hitting countries where, in fact, there has already been a wave of working class and popular insurgency. If you think, for example, about the enormous uprising of young people against transit hikes in Chile, which then produced three general strikes as unions came out in solidarity with the young people. It started over transit hikes, but then it spread. And not coincidentally, there was a feminist component to that upsurge, which has now won reproductive rights in Chile at a level that's never been accomplished before. We see something similar in Colombia, something similar in Peru, and so on. I think we have to really pay attention to a rising wave of popular struggle in Latin America in the next year or two. And I think that you can't, for instance, put Bolsonaro's defeat outside that context recently. These kinds of developments are going to be the key to blocking the right, which, as Michael says, we know is very potent and dangerous right now, these new far right forces, but they struggle for traction when broad popular upheavals take place, where in fact, social movements and unions are beginning to address the key questions of the moment. And I, su I suspect that we're going to see some really significant kinds of insurgencies in parts of Latin America, but I'm also not without hope where it comes to rebuilding working class organizations and a more viable left in places like the United States either. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's important to it's important to mention the the how it fuels the the right and the far right. Um, especially we know, you know, the 2008 crisis brought about extreme polarization. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, how will this crisis impact geopolitics? Will states turn to more protectionist measures? And how will it affect globalization? Um, and what will this do to rivalries between states or, or imperialism, maybe? It's a very good question. Um, clearly, um, the 21st century, one of the features of the 21st century is the end of globalization in a way that we've seen uh, the period of the last two decades of the 20th century saw this huge expansion of global trade, 
the breaking down of tariff barriers and other barriers, but also the dramatic expansion of capital exports and the uh, spread by uh, multinational companies from the global north into the global south to exploit the labour of the global south and also to develop their financial and other areas of, of control over the global south countries. But since um, in the 21st century, that's beginning to reverse. What we've now seen is a declining in global trade growth. Um, whereas it was growing faster than global growth, that's GDP growth, it's now more or less the other way around, or at least no better. Global trade growth has slowed down even slower uh, than global GDP growth, which means that the escape valve for capitalism of expanding exports abroad, of expanding finance, of trying to use the labour of the of the global south to get extra profits is becoming more difficult to achieve. And that and also that has meant that the hegemonic position of you of the US economy and the US dollar has also relatively begun to decline. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate the fact that the US dollar is still the dominant currency in the world and the US economy is still the biggest economy and the most important capitalist economy in the world, particularly militarily, of course. Uh, but it has lost its overall dominance and increasingly there's a share uh, of uh, trade, growth and finance which has moved elsewhere, not just into Europe and Japan and the other G7 economies, but now we begin to see it with a rising, uh, pro particularly of course of China, but also in the case of India and other countries that are no longer completely dominated or in fact in direct opposition uh, to US imperialism and their allies. And now we enter a political period, particularly from the Russia-Ukraine war, where we have this division of uh, political influence between different geopolitical groups that is developing. It's no longer going to be a unipolar world or Pax Americana. We're now entering a multipolar world where US and its allies to some extent in Europe, and then we have these new forces of Russia and China, perhaps in alliance, maybe not, uh, with other uh, developments which are no longer uh, straightforwardly under the grip. Whenever we've had a multipolar world under capitalism, it, it led to serious conflict, geopolitical conflict, because uh, it's much easier if one dominant power can set the peace, uh, like the police, the world's policemen. If we're now going to have a struggle between different uh, blocks over the control of trade, finance and investment, that could also mean uh, an intensification of the risks of military conflict. And of course, we know the big one will be if we have such a conflict between China and the US uh, sometime in this towards the end of this decade or even earlier. I totally agree with what Michael has said there. Uh, and I think people have to understand because very often our thinking about the world takes some time to catch up to new realities new phenomena, new developments. It was very easy for us to understand a certain historical period as one of the globalization of capital. And there were all kinds of measures by which you could make the case. Now they were overstated in a variety of ways and so on, but they captured something real. I think Michael is right to say that period is over. We are now seeing the, the fragmentation of the global economy and global power in ways in which there are now contending blocks to a greater degree than we have seen since the Cold War era. And so this is a, a kind of post-Cold War blockification, if you will, of, of the world system. And I think some people, you know, in the mainstream in the US thought that protectionism was simply a Trump phenomenon. They were wrong. The Biden administration has doubled down on protectionism towards China, particularly in a key strategic area like microchips. And it is doing everything it can to impede the global flow of technology, intellectual property, scientific knowledge, and indeed even capital flows in, in the sector. That doubling down, which, you know, takes the uh, on protectionism, which, which can take the ludicrous dimension, say, of an attack on TikTok. Now, you know, I'm not the TikTok demographic, 
So it, 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 it's not huge for me, but there are a lot of people uh, for whom that is a real issue. But the point is, it's part of the performance of global rivalry, whereas the real issues lie around things like microchips, new technologies, new weapon systems, new surveillance systems, and so on. I could say the same thing about the so-called spy balloon that Biden had shot down. I mean, come on, really? We're, we're that naive that we don't understand that there is mutual spying 24 seven happening between these different centers of power in the world. Of course there are, but it's highly performative and it's designed to whip up the fear of the other center of power in the world. And so it's a much more dangerous time as well in global politics for us right now. And for all the reasons that Michael and I were talking about, these tendencies that are dangerous are likely to get worse, not better in the context of a global slump. Uh, but at the same time, and I think it's something that each of us has been at pains to highlight, this kind of crisis poses a series of key political questions like, how long do you want to continue with a banking system where private where profits are private and losses are public, for instance. J those kinds of questions, as they did in the aftermath of the 2008-9 crisis, with, and we saw them manifest with both the Corbyn phenomenon in Britain and the Sanders phenomenon in the United States, this will open up new political space. And then the key question becomes all of that grassroots on the ground political organizing that we hope so many of the people who are listening to us today uh, are a part of. So it's not to deny that this is a very volatile, dangerous time for all of us, but it is also to say that the there are multiple possibilities that get opened up in a moment like this, and some of them involve openings to the left as we saw during the last crisis. And so the question is always open for us historically. Class struggles not over, popular insurgencies are not over, working class and socialist movements are anything but finished at this moment. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you wanna add any last comments and then? I think David has summed it up. I, I was struggling to think of anything to add just to remind everybody though that we there are things that like the climate emergency and global warming is not an issue that's far away now it's part of this all of the, the challenges facing us and capitalism for that matter uh, for the, in this decade these these questions are going to have to be resolved one way or the other before this decade is out in my view so time is running out if you want to put it that way for considering this and it's time uh, we move on to, but with a better understanding, to take action about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you to, to both of you, uh, Michael and, and David. I, I definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure a lot of others did. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming today, uh, to Haymarket and, and Sean and Amanda and Ashley. Um, remember to subscribe to Spectre Journal for, for more Marxist politics, and see you at the next event.